Please find your seats and sit down so we can start the meeting. Thank you very much. Then we can start the meeting and I hand over to Alex, please. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this first ever conference on education and statistics. My name is Alex Selby Boothroyd. I'm the head of data journalism at The Economist. When I first heard about this conference, I was thrilled to be asked to take part because data is so important to, to what I do and what we do at The Economist. It's essential to telling stories. This morning, we'll hear from our hosts and our keynote speaker, Professor James Heckman, economist and Nobel laureate, before turning to a high-level panel to start the day. First, can I run through some housekeeping rules, please? Um, could you keep your phones on silent? Uh, the hashtag for the conference is data for education. An interpretation is available in English, French, and Spanish using the speakers in front of you. Um, I, I can't really overemphasize the importance of data for policy making and development. Information is not just power, but it's a catalyst for change. I, th I think the, the best example from my world of data journalism is um, when John Snow, the physician in London in 1854, uh, went round houses in Soho uh, asking people where they got their water from, and he was able to map that data and work out which pump was supplying water with cholera. So he saved lives just through collecting data and, and displaying it in an effective way. At, at The Economist, we do this a lot. I look back through our archive and I, I found three stories from the last few months about uh, data and education. We wrote about Narendra Modi's ultimate test of educating 265 million pupils in India. We had, someone had to count those. Um, we looked at why Vietnam schools are so good. And we looked at why English school children are still missing months of classes. The thing that struck me about all of these articles that we wrote is they were full of statistics and data. They all contained charts. And, and this is the most effective way of comparing countries and children in those countries. I took a look further back too, and I found uh, an article from an American correspondent of The Economist who sought to narrate through statistics the origin, progress, and present condition of the school system in the state of Pennsylvania. This is from 1846, so the, the use of statistics to assess education has been known for a long time. It's essential. I think the key word there is to narrate as well. There's no story or narrative without data. And for the millions of our school children around the world, without data, their stories cannot be told. This is why we're all here today. We want to find ways to improve the quality of data on education. With that, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Assistant Director General of Education for UNESCO, Stefania Giannini. Thank you so much. Uh, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to UNESCO for this first global conference on the importance of data in education and for education. Welcome. Dear Professor Heckman, for invitation. Bienvenue, Excellence le Ministre. Welcome, Excellencies, Ministers, and all participants who are joining us today. It's a very important event. Conference uh, with uh, a few, three key messages, if you allow me. The first message is a very simple one. I'm pretty sure I'm preaching the converting in this room, but let me reiterate this message as well. Data matter. Data matter because uh, data and statistics are increasingly recognized as fundamental to achieving uh, the 2030 agenda as a whole, especially education. Data can provide a clear picture and inform our action to achieve all SDGs when it comes to education uh, it's about uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the mission that we have uh, in SDG4, uh, quality, inclusive education for all. And we know now, luckily, a little bit better and more on questions like whether children are 
in or out of school, which is crucial, a very basic, important question to, to find the right answer. How many teachers are needed? If schools have internet connectivity and education financing gap. These data guide the policy decisions, global discourse and donors priorities. But also data uh, play a vital role in enhancing educational outcomes by supporting uh, planning, monitoring progress and evaluating process policies. As you, many of you know, in the follow-up to the Transforming Education Summit, a milestone key process event launched two years ago by the Secretary General of the UN, we now need to see where transformation is happening, how and with which outcomes. And this is once again about the importance of data. For instance, the new benchmark indicators on green in education, on school connectivity, and on youth participation to the transformation, which has to happen at country level, are crucial and important developments in the follow-up to the summit. But we all know that education doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in communities, and it's affected by a wide range of factors, which is why we need, uh, I would say, an intersectorial and intersectional approach to data. Data on the links uh, between education, health, and nutrition illustrate this point very well. We saw so clearly during the COVID-19, and uh, possibly you remember the joint force uh, between uh, World Bank, UNESCO, UNICEF, uh, to have a picture, a clear picture of the state of the art of uh, well-being, health, and learning in schools for children, schools, virtual schools, actually, in that case. And school meals have been found to increase enrollment and attendance rates by 9 to 8 percent, respectively, leading to investment in school feeding programs and improved outcomes for students. This is a good example. And uh, in gathering data, we need to consider also a lifelong learning perspective across all education levels, from early childhood education and care to pre-primary, secondary, and a diversity range of learning environments, including workplaces, communities, and online learning. Well, the last few years have seen notable progress, thanks to all of you in this room, let's say, to partnership, to uh, international organization, to m governments, ministries, to make uh, data a priority. And of course, for us, the UNESCO Institute of Statistics is the, 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 the pillar uh, and the reference institution uh, as the main provider of international data in education. But unfortunately, we all know that despite this progress, we still face significant gaps, data gaps. A global, let's say, invisible classroom of uh, over half a billion children have been left out of learning assessment. And even where data do exist, they are often outdated, fragmented, and incomplete. So much work remains to be done to fill these gaps. And this leads me to my second, and I think this global conference is really an important, uh, important, a unique opportunity to, to start this conversation. And this leads me to my second message today. We needed to strengthen the nexus between data, better data, and policy. And this is about creating a real culture of data. How can we do that? We first need to ensure that data is accessible to policymakers, which is not always the case today. Leaders in the education field, I'm sure ministers and other uh, outstanding speakers will, uh, will uh, confirm this point, uh, need what can be described now as a missing dashboard, one that holds basic cross-cutting intersectorial education data that can be used for evidence-based decision-making. UNESCO is investing in just these kinds of tools. Let me mention the dashboard 
for or country commitments and actions to transform education, but let me mention especially the SDG4 scorecard, a tool developed by UIS and the Global Education Monitoring Report to track and to report the progress towards SDG4. So a culture of data is also marked by principles of transparency, collaboration, participation, and openness. At the international level, this requires a global community of practice defines and agrees on concept, definitions, standards, and methodologies. The education data agenda is a global agenda for the common good, and we need all countries to contribute. These are both, I suppose, aims of this conference. And finally, as in all fields, transforming data into policy action requires capacity, political will, and investment, we really have to stress this last point. We need to invest in data. We know that countries are the ones best placed to monitor the quality of their education systems, and this is why UNESCO invests in capacity building. But we know that uh, investing in data collection also plays important return. The Global Partnership for Sustainable Development data estimates an, an average return of $32 for every dollar invested in strengthening data system in low and middle income countries. Well, last point, really my third and final message, let's say, data are the future and the future needs data, modernized data, I would say. Um, we need to go beyond the traditional service uh, and make use of new types and sources of data. New technologies we all know, like AI, of course, are revolutionizing the way we access, analyze, and share data. And this has important implications on the future of knowledge and based on the knowledge we get on the policy making. We have seen interesting examples emerging from education systems and institutions around the world already applying technology in support and personalized learning assessment and admissions. Let me mention Indonesia, for instance, among the other countries uh, using the geospatial data to identify safest route to build a school. And this is a simple, concrete example of what I'm in mind. So UNESCO is also exploring how to harness the potential of technology for data analysis. I'm happy to announce that this week, on Friday, I suppose, the very last part of this conference, we are uh, happy to uh, present and to release a new pilot large language model, model linked to the UIS uh, SDG4 database with a, an interactive chatbot to extract data analysis, charts, figures, and respond to the needs of users and decision makers. And uh, I do believe that, uh, you know, uh, also the, 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 the large discussion we are, we are having in the UN, but which is very much beyond the horizon of the UN on the summit of the future, on the pact for the future, which will be discussed and validated, uh, adopted in September uh, on the margin of the, of the UN General Assembly, has to include a strong component on data. Because as I just mentioned, the future needs better data, and data are actually the future in for education and beyond. So thank you so much for coming here and thank you, Silvia, for taking this initiative. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, my name is Silvia Montoya. I am the director of uh, UNESCO Institute for Statistics. So on behalf of my team and myself, you are also joining uh, Stefani and welcoming you here in Paris. And thank you for the traveling. We know that it's complicated and it's an effort, and especially for the ones who are coming from, from very far. This is a unique occasion for the UIS and for me personally. Let me start by saying that the resolution, uh, UNESCO General Conference resolution that established in 1999, uh, the UIS, call upon its governing board to define and establish the type of statistical data and indicators which will be needed at the international level, taking advantage of high-profile consultative mechanism to be set by the UIS. As we celebrate this year, our 25th anniversary, this conference is a moment we put the capstone 
at the apex of our consultative architecture. It is a way to systematize, to consolidate, and to shape our various efforts to invite and act upon member states' ideas on producing comparable education statistics. Any community of practice needs a forum for discussion, knowledge exchange, and sharing of best practices. Our peers, the labor statisticians, celebrated last year the 100th anniversary of their conference convened by the International Labor Organization every five years. This year, the UN Statistical Commission, who oversees the, the global uh, data system, is celebrating the 78 years, and I am proud to say that UNESCO was one of the first handful organizations that joined and uh, show interest in trying to measure concepts after the Second World War. The demand for education statisticians to communicate with each other has intensified since 2015. SDG 4, the first truly universal education goal, expressed the belief that education is the means to achieve all other sustainable development goals. The belief was based on the growing understanding to which Professor Heckman has contributed that is, that is what the student learn that matters. The 2030 agenda is enormously ambitious, including from a statistical perspective. New concepts were put forward for measurement, but many were far ahead of available statistics, and an appropriate approach to generate indicators often did not exist. There were doubts whether it was even feasible to reach consensus on definitions. Education remains a fiercely national domain of policy where each country uses a different language and has a different understanding of the same concepts. Our role as international organization is to facilitate dialogue to bring out the common elements. Our responsibility is just not to give to member states a voice, but to ensure that they are at the center of all relevant decisions. This conference is a milestone of a long process in that direction. And I want to stress that process is as important, if not even sometimes more important, than outcomes. The UIS has worked methodically in the recent years to fulfill this role. In 2016, we established the Technical Cooperation Group on SDG4 Indicators and primary, the primary intergovernmental body to work on the development of our education monitoring framework. Step by step, thanks to the contribution of member states and partners, we have developed technical standards for most indicators, global and thematic, on minimum proficiency in reading and mathematics, on global citizenship, on adequate understanding of geosciences, on functional literacy for youth and adults, and so on. We have recently made some progress on the elusive definition of qualified teachers. The importance of setting standards based on collaboration, partnership, and consensus is central to this conference. But consensus needs constant and good communication. This conference marks also a moment of TCG membership rotation. And I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the outgoing members and welcome the new members who will receive from this conference for the next three years the guidance. We want to build a robust governance of education data and statistics that is part of the global education cooperation mechanism, which Stefania tirelessly leads and co-chairs with the Minister of Education of Chile. The TCG should take a pride in having selected a subset of benchmark indicators in 2019. Countries were invited to set national targets for those for 2025 and 2030. Unlike previous agendas, and unlike other sectors, we now have a unique mechanism in education in which countries share their aims and hope for their citizens but also with the rest of the world, what their contribution to the global goal will be. It is a process that promotes accountability in a constructive way, but it's also a formative process that helps countries to reflect on their targets. The process of receiving country benchmarks, submissions, and assessing their progress was another trigger for this conference. It brought to the surface difference in understanding of definitions on data sources, even for this small set of indicators. The benchmarking process also gave more focus to new kinds of capacity development needed for national statistical systems. 
how to invest in skilled people and skill of people and strong institutions, but also how to nurture the political leadership to use data for policy. The demands are increasing. Historically, education statistics rely on a single source of data. But as health and labor statistics have shown, it is not longer tenable to ignore the existence of multiple data sources for which we need new methods to use efficiently. We have introduced and we will present to you such approaches which we believe should be extended to other indicators. As we express concerns about the data gaps, we also discover new sources and new ways of extracting information. Technology, including artificial intelligence, will play a growing role in those developments, potentially changing the face and the organization of official statistics, data production, visualization, and analytics. We will debate this issue this week. But much as we learn from frictionless technology-based solutions, talking to people is the most effective way to inspire change. I ask that you come with an open mind to find common ground to improve comparability. We are looking forward to coming out of the conference with every country understanding better each other's needs. We consider a shared understanding as necessary to develop a standards that reflect in education fundamental human rights. We would like to mark this celebration with some products. The laser index that is released this week is the first approach of the type, reflect country education data ecosystem capacity to guide actions. The AMPOL report showcases a cost-efficient solution for measuring learning outcomes in low and middle-income countries. And the SDG4 scorecard, the second report on the efforts that country has been making towards the, their 2025 and 2030 national benchmarks. You have heard from Stefania that on Friday we will present it also some exploration on artificial intelligence use. Many solutions will be tabled over the next few days, which I hope we can take forward. Looking forward at our achievements and at the challenges ahead, I would like to thank you for your trust and goodwill to be here at this inaugural conference. I am fully committed and I am sure that we are going to be shaping together our future. In something I have learned from you in working together all this last year is that we are up to the challenge and we are going to be able to deliver. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Silvia Montoya, and, and before that, Stefania Giannini. We're now um, going to hear the keynote speech from Professor James Heckman. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I want to welcome you all on, on behalf of UNESCO, but in particular, will express my own gratitude for being invited to speak here today. It's an honor, and it's an honor to be the inaugural speaker at an inaugural conference on data and statistics. And it's also an honor to meet so many distinguished scholars and leaders from around the world today on educational statistics, and I hope we have a chance to exchange ideas. As you all know, without really important, uh, the importance of the education, but uh, you know that you don't need me to tell you that. On the other hand, it might be useful to remind you the important changes in education and the role of education in leading the world and leading, in changing society. In my mind, even though there's much discussion about climate change, and I'm not saying anything against the discussions of climate change, the topic of education around the world is far more important. And why do I say this? I say this because, unlike the debate over climate change, the important role of education is factually well-based, and the benefits are extremely well-documented. All of the uncertainty that surrounds the discussion on climate change is not present here when you look at education. We know that education is a major source of personal and intellectual growth 
and of national growth as well. Education, an educated population is a productive population. It's more flexible and adaptable to the change that is a central feature of a dynamic economy and of a changing world, rapidly changing world. But education is also essential to personal realization and equalization of opportunity. It's the lifeblood of a productive society. I'll give you a quote to uh, illustrate uh, exactly the thinking going back at least uh, almost 200 years now by Horace Mann, who was, of course, a pioneer in developing education in the United States and developing the common school in particular. But I think this is important to keep in mind how central the role of education is in terms of giving equality, in terms of providing opportunity, and in terms of advancing the uh, condition of the poor and essentially producing a more productive and balanced society. But I also think today when we think about education, it's very useful to put it in perspective. Formal education, which is frequently emphasized in discussions of this sort, is only part of the component of the process of learning. It's an important part, but education and learning is much more than just formal instruction in brick and mortar schools. Teachers and schooling are important. And when we've come to understand the nature of how education is obtained, how learning is achieved, we have to understand a much greater role for components of society that frequently get ignored. For example, for the last 60 years or so, since the origination of the Coleman Report on the United States and looking at differences in performance among schools, we know that parents and family environments play a very, very important role. And engaging the family and engaging the parents in the education of the children is a central way to promote education and to promote learning. We also know there's other learning going on as well, and it's important that we foster this and think about this more globally in creating a uh, educational statistics system. Peers at school, uh, peers in the neighborhood, so much of what we learn is not just by going to a classroom and learning from a lecture, but also from learning from each other, from exchanging ideas, and also from imitating what other more successful, more learned people know and do, and taking and adopting those lessons for ourselves. So this notion of a social framework for understanding learning and education is essential. So we learn by doing, we learn by imitation, and these are major sources of learning. And job training, too, which is frequently considered often a different uh, agenda, a different part of the government, a different part of a social policy, is a crucial part of learning. Not only in the sense of integrating apprenticeship systems with schools, but also in terms of integrating uh, the uh, knowledge of on-the-job training and exchange of ideas from older to younger to more experienced to less experienced individuals. And so I do know that a major goal of this conference is to develop and apply measures of learning and measures of the determinants of all of these aspects of learning. Now this conference is the first of a series of planned conferences that aim to create an international community of measurement, practice, and analysis among educational statisticians and thought leaders and ministers around the world. The importance of this community cannot be overstated. And so I really commend UNESCO for bringing together this group and trying to form not just a group that meets every once in a while, but a community of actively engaged, exchanging scholars. I can talk about my own experience in this regard, uh, certainly over my whole lifetime in a number of different areas I've worked in. I found that these conferences, which have both formal and informal exchanges, lectures that we, are, we will see in a standard format, but also lectures and exchanges over coffee, over, over exchanges in the evening, even in debates during the conference itself, will play a very important role. In my own thinking, for example, and I did a lot of work early on on discrete choice, uh, so-called economics of discrete choice, and looking at discrete data, and looking at selection issues. 
and those conferences that I attended early on in my career and the friendships I made from those conferences have lasted a lifetime and have been a source of constant stimulation and encouragement including people telling me how crazy I am about this or what a good idea this is and so forth. But those are very, very important kinds of interactions that we typically minimize. But many other fields have this operated in this way and successful groups that can exchange. So I think the theme of today and the theme of the next few days is to try to learn to, from each other to learn some ideas, to hear some proposals, but also then to synthesize these ideas together and synthesize not just within a particular field. I am an economist, I do a lot of work in economics, but I also draw a lot on psychology, behavioral economics, and these syntheses that actually help create whole new fields that become very productive. So these research networks not only have shaped my life, but they will shape yours as well. And so these interactions and debates are really important. So what do we know? We know that Around, uh, oops, wait a minute, uh, it isn't quite what I had in mind here, but uh, let's see if I can get back, okay. Here we are. Well, I guess I'm not going to find it. We know that databases are rapidly expanding around the world and at different rates and, and somehow in being able to create these databases and synthesize and use them is an extremely important role of this conference. And we know something too about data and we have to be very careful in understanding it. And that is that the facts never speak for themselves. And the facts we collect are guided by concepts of theory. So integral to putting together and unifying these data sets and coming up with common concepts is common theory, ways that essentially provide ways to explain data and what we, we need to do. Now, I'll give you an example of this in terms of the educational knowledge and statistics. In the past, we used to think that IQ was all that matters and that many people thought it was genetically determined. This is like 100 years ago in the, genetic, in the eugenics movement. And that educational policy consists mainly of tracking people and s assigning them to slots. That's a conceptual model. And it's a model that has been heavily challenged and uh, consistently and correctly, I think, criticized. But as is actually the case, people can learn and change. And that creates a different kind of way of even looking at data, of analyzing the growth of children, of understanding what opportunities should be made in schools and in preschools. And therefore, I think it's important that we, we conceptualize correctly the data that we need to understand how people grow and how they change. And I think this will be a very important goal of this conference. Now we know that lots of high quality national data are becoming available. Administrative data are being studied. In Western Europe, for example, the data collected for the welfare state varies among countries, places like the Nordic countries in Denmark and in Norway and, uh, and in Sweden, a very rich data sets exist that link individuals. But those national data can also, are also available in other countries as well. And it's turned out successively that linking is, many more countries have linked records together, administrative records, allowing us to track individuals, to act, track firms, to track schools, that we can actually then create a much richer database for understanding the world and understanding what we do in schools and what schools do to people. So what we should also look at is taking those studies and blending them with surveys. We know that there are many NGOs and national organizations that operate alone. They stand alone, they provide some kind of information on a particular sector of the economy or maybe just some region. But integrating those studies in with the administrative data is surely a very worthy goal. And then finally, linking these data sets to experiments. There are a lot of social experiments now being performed around the world. Many organizations promoted this. And I think the use of these kinds of data is really very valuable and in integrating these data sets. And I strongly encourage you to think of ways to try to use the available data. Now I recognize that not all countries have the kind of wealth of the uh, Nordic states in terms of administrative data. 
But there are census records. My own country, the United States, we're now making progress and putting together public records that previously were separated. And that's created a whole new understanding of how uh, human beings uh, prosper and how they suffer, what causes their, them to be limited and what causes them to grow. Now we know from my own use, my own use, use that personal cross-national data have really been very valuable. I've been engaged in studies comparing the U.S. Uh, with Nordic uh, welfare states. And there are all kinds of challenges that come in making that data. Uh, we know that uh, education um, is a very, very uh, difficult concept because as was previously said, different organizations, different states define terms differently. And it's been a challenge for me even in making a simple comparison between Denmark and the United States. But the challenge is not insurmountable. And again, it's the conceptual framework, asking what's being learned? How do these different components of learning interact with each other, and how do we go forward? So in this sense, I think, even though the challenges are there, and of course, always better data, more data that's clearly and honestly reported is really very valuable. But integrating it together, putting it together, and interpreting it within a framework is extremely important. So I think that we should also think very clearly about the process of evaluation. A lot of the activity of education consists of understanding which processes, which strategies, which educational uh, strategies allow us to have the most effective uh, guidance for promoting students and promoting schools and promoting uh, the, the society's growth. Now there are two kinds of analyses that we typically use. And both, I think, are very important. And it's not a question of pitting one against the other, but of using both in a constructive way. Historically, the way that this was done was what was called input-based analysis, content analysis, process analysis. But this came as a result of seeing which outcomes were successful for children, and which ones, and how the mechanisms produced those outcomes and how transportable those mechanisms were across different environments. And so that input-based analysis is very, very valuable and should not be denigrated in any sense and should be an integral part of evaluation and collection of data. Now, of course, more familiar these days are output-based analyses, test scores, things that look things like life outcomes, earnings, health, happiness, and so forth. We know that there's a lot of work on that as well. But these two forms of evaluation should exist side by side. But in particular, understanding how those test scores, how those earnings, what the mechanisms are that are transportable across societies that can be used and that how, in fact, what we do to produce those outcomes. So it's the mechanism and the output evaluation both. Now, in terms of comparability, this is something that was already mentioned and I think it's really essential. In my own work in Denmark, comparing Denmark to the United States, recent work, I've been, I found that you know, there are terms like community colleges that are, that are basically uh, post-secondary uh, uh, education systems for children going into primarily vocational education. And comparing those with places in Denmark where this, the, the comparable institution is not there. It's there, but under a different name. These pose challenges. And so when we think about trying to institute things like training programs in schools, understanding exactly what is going on and how teachers are equipped and prepared, we need to really think very hard and long about the conventions that create uh, a, a learning opportunity. But here's what I mean by comparability and making, oops, here we are. Here's, here's some, you know, I, I'm, I'm told that every equation, uh, <laughs> you lose half the audience. So here, I hope, I hope you don't walk out on me on this equation. But this is a very familiar equation, and it's very intuitive. It basically just says, and this is the Jacob Menzer equation on earnings and schooling, which is used widely around the world to evaluate the effectiveness of educational systems in terms of earning potential of the, of the students. And if you look, for example, at the relationship of the log of earnings on schooling and experience, this creates a framework for comparison. The World Bank and many other organizations will systematize so we can understand which countries are more successful or not. A higher beta here in this equation 
is generally associated with a higher level of schooling, producing outcomes. And we have other methods, though, other issues, occupational and educational choice. Uh, even understanding occupations can be a challenge. Another component which has received a lot of attention is the question of social mobility. If you look at, say, the income of the parent, which is Y sub C here, on the uh, 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 y sub, the income of the child, sorry, on the income of the parent, that coefficient beta in that equation in line three there is a measure of mobility. So the lower beta is, the higher the mobility in a given society, less stratified societies are. And so when we think about uh, developing tools for education, we also should think about developing an analytical tools for us analyzing the data from education and putting them on a standardized footing and develop these tools that help us evaluate. Now in a conference in education, I think it's really important uh, to think about life cycle learning. Life cycle learning is an integral part of uh, what I do these days but also it's an integral part of what is important for education. And it's very important that we understand, I think, for our purposes today, and then going forward, oops, I had a little trouble with this. Yes, understanding the skills that matter. What we've come to understand much more, it used to be back 60 years ago, the so-called cognitive psychology revolution, that IQ and matters of just abstract thinking were the ones, both components most highly valued and the ones that we very valued schools based on. That was still a remnant in some sense of a much earlier time when IQ tests were introduced, here actually in France, but, uh, and, and used to sort and uh, evaluate teachers and students and schools all around the world. But what we've come to understand, and this is extremely important, is that many major social and economic problems can be traced to low levels of skill and ability, and not just cognitive ability, and that we need to understand inventories of skills, and that these abilities are multiple in nature, and that we should really think much more beyond just IQ or PISA scores, not that those aren't valuable tools, I'm not saying that, but these so-called non-cognitive abilities, the ones that aren't examined in the standard way with multiple choice questions and so forth, are also vital. And we did develop inventories of those skills. And fortunately, tools have been developed that at low cost can be applied to provide national inventories. And so what we need to do is, uh, is, is to think beyond just the achievement test. Although the, having an achievement test system is very, very good. The thing to avoid is the overly strong reliance on achievement tests as a means of thinking about not only what teachers do, but what systems do. There's sometimes a national ranking in China where I frequently work. There's a lot of pride that Shanghai does very well on the PISA test. A lot of criticism of those tests as well. As well. And of course, Shanghai is not the all of, Chica of China. But nonetheless, the important thing is that we have skills that are multiple in nature. And sometimes these skills are denigrated. They're not considered important. They're called soft skills or character skills. But that we know them to be important. And we studied them. And I'll give you an example in a minute. That literally ignoring personality and character is a very dangerous practice. And if we lie too much on standardized achievement tests or IQ tests or tests only of cognition, we're missing important dimensions, important predictive dimensions, not only for success in school, but also for success in life and throughout. So what I want to emphasize is that we want to specify not just, uh, uh, yes, we don't want to emphasize uh, specific outcomes of you know, IQ or something. Cognitive and, and uh, non-cognitive traits together are extremely important. And we've come to also understand the important link in biology and in the fact of mental and physical health. And so what we've come to understand as we learn about how human knowledge is acquired is the following, and this is the finding of a large body of work, that a common low dimensional set of capabilities, the term differently, traits, uh, whatever, predict a lot of outcomes. So I wouldn't call them traits, I would call them skills because most of these traits that we think of as trait-like things can be changed, including IQ. So we know that comparative advantage is very important. 
We also know there's a lot of variety out there and schooling systems should recognize the variety and in terms of teaching strategies and, and strategies of instruction should learn about those strategies. Now the, we know also from a large body of evidence that these traits, these skills that we're talking about have direct causal effects on wages, schooling, crime, smoking, participation in the larger society voting in democratic societies. And let me give you a very simple example of the danger of relying only on tests and the value of these social and emotional traits. I've worked a lot in the past on something called the GED. The GED is a test given in the United States to students who drop out of secondary school. It's an achievement test. It's very much like a PISA test or a test like uh, what's sometimes called the Armed Forces Qualifying Test. These are achievement tests. And it's a, an achievement test that, that uh, high school dropouts are used to certify that they're equivalent. And so the question then becomes, what do we learn from long-term lessons of the GED? And this came from my own analysis of longitudinal data, looking how GEDs came, prospered, or didn't prosper. And what we learned was it's much more than academic achievement is required for success. This is, not this is obviously something we all know at a deeply intuitive level. But sometimes when we gather together as professional educators, looking study at education, we tend to forget these lessons. And so what happens is there are many, many aspects of education and many, many aspects of the skills produced. And therefore, I think what we need to do is think very long and hard about notions that rely strictly on accountability systems alone or valuing teachers by how many more, how much value added they have at a given school or a given, a given individual. Those can play an important role, but what we know is that the tests themselves are very incomplete. And in fact, the, the test scores themselves can be very wide. Long back ago, to go back to a source that I quoted, back uh, the founder of the common school movement in the United States, Horace Mann, years ago was talking exactly about trying to come up with tests and how should he evaluate the schools, what schools do. And I think he made a very important point that's useful to keep in mind in this conference. He says arithmetic, grammar, and the other rudiments, as they're called, comprise but a small part of a teaching of a school. And the rudiments of feeling are taught not less than the rudiments of thinking. And therefore, when we think about what we're doing is we're producing. So let me give you some examples of what we mean by this. When we think about, for example, what a purely cognitive skill orientation framework would do, look at the GED. I'm going to put up a graph of a, a, a graph here. And these are graphing. These look like normal distributions, you know, the you know, bell curve and so forth. And what you see is basically uh, for women in the United States, that people who pass the GED, women, uh, are just as smart as ordinary high school graduates who don't go on to college. So that's a, uh, it's, you know, a very close relationship. Those two curves on the right there, they're very close to each other. The curve on the left there, shifted to the left, is the GEDs uh, with no college. And uh, uh, the uh, people who are high school dropouts are the ones farther to the left. The GEDs with high school, uh, and high school graduates are basically about the same in terms of ability. We get similar pattern for males. So in what sense? The non-cognitive skills, though, the GEDs, even though they're just as smart as high school graduates, actually resemble dropouts. And why? They lack, so here, for example, if I look at the skills, that I look at non-cognitive skills comparing the GEDs with the dropouts, the GDs and the dropouts have very similar non-cognitive skills. And why? These are the people who lack perseverance. These are the people who drop out. They quit in almost every stage of life on opportunities. Their wages are far lower. We can go through lots of data here. People are mentioning graphs. Uh, you might be very tired of graphs already, but nonetheless, here are a few more. And so what we see is that if the GDs, the dark group, are earning much less than the high school graduates, and these are people with the same cognitive ability, and that's important. So if we look at measures of outcomes that we know that matter, things like employment, things like participation in welfare, 
like drug use, like whether or not you have stable family life. All of these factors are changed greatly. Uh, and people who have the GD are low in those skills. So what do we need to do in thinking about this? Not only do you need to think more inclusively about what skills matter, but to adopt a life cycle perspective. There's a huge amount of research that documents the importance of early life parental, social, and environmental factors. And a developmental approach is needed to understand this. So what have we come to understand? Well, these skills that I just spoke about are important to function and to flourish. And that this low dimensional core set of skills, which we can measure, is actually a very vital for participation. But we come to understand that these skills, all of these skills, these social and emotional skills, not only are important predicting life outcomes, but they're also very important in the sense they can be influenced. And we can teach these schools skills. And we can teach them in schools, and we can teach them out of schools as well. And we've come to understand, too, that when we look at the development of these skills over the life cycle, there are earlier periods for, non, for cognitive skills, later for social and emotional skills, and things like executive functioning, which help guide self-control for adolescents. These things, these skills start to emerge in the adolescent years, and they create a pattern. So we need to think a pattern of where there's opportunity to evaluate. So thinking about education, we don't think, well, we ignore what happened before schooling, so we think of school starting at grade one or in kindergarten. No. We start thinking at the very earliest years in preschool, and in kindergarten comes later, and that schooling comes later. They're all connected, and they create a vital role and sense of how school skills evolve. So let me just give you some idea here about the, how uh, skills the important role of skills and what we can do about that in shaping educational policy. We know that ability gaps open up very early, both cognitive and non-cognitive. So for example, if we look at, uh, uh, at education, and we look at age adjusted, these are comparisons now at a given age, children uh, of uh, at age three and at age 18, the gap, oops, sorry, the gap if you can see that, between the, the more affluent children, the ones whose line is on top, and those less affluent at age 18 is substantial. So this is the mother being a high school dropout is at the bottom, the mother being a college graduate is at the top. So there's substantial gaps, and we know about those gaps. But the important thing to notice is that age adjusted, that those gaps are there very early in the life of the child. And that controlling for family environments, we also know, and supplementing them, we can help eliminate those gaps. We get similar gaps in the social and emotional skills. And these gaps have counterparts in family investments and environments. So uh, I think uh, what we need to understand, and this goes back to the point I made much earlier, that family environments are playing a very important role. And the way that schools interact with families is sometimes neglected in discussions about educational policy. The family supports the school, it supports the child in the school, and that we also know that the structure of the family plays a big role. Uh, and there's something that we can do in the sense of supplementing the school. Preschools and nursery schools are playing a very vital role in integrating the child's parents into the life of the child and the child's learning. So we know that in part uh, that early experiences are important, but we also know that we can compensate, okay? So a major channel is through uh, the risks. Uh, the, the, it comes through essentially the early interventions can be one way, and it's a way to add to the list of normal interventions in schools. But we also need to think more broadly about schools and, we, and what education is doing, and when education starts. It starts at birth, and some people would say it starts in the womb. So we need to think more broadly about modeling the, the capability formation process. And this is governed by a multi-stage technology, and that's what we need to think about. And this multi-stage technology, I'm, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm gonna scoot through some of this quickly, but I give you an idea without this graph here gives you an idea that this is the way I think is very instructive to think about education and to think about learning. 
Prenatal conditions are vital. We know that children who are born, say, during the El Nino periods in places like Peru and Colombia have actually had very severe stress. And even though the, the nutritional ingredients are not so bad, uh, nonetheless, they were seriously retarded in their schooling compared to children born in other periods. And so the whole process of going from the earliest years down into mature adulthood, where learning is taking place at every stage, is an integral part of what we should think about. And that we should think more broadly about the dynamic synergy of skill formation. These skills cross foster each other. A healthy child is a child who learns. A healthy child and motivated child. A motivated child will also be somebody who's anxious to go and learn new things and experience new events, open to experience. And so we get this notion of a graph where we have the synergies. These groups together are producing major in investments. And so if we think about something, the early years play a very important role. It's like a, like a building of a, of a tree or planting of a plant. And so what we can do is we see that there's tremendous gains that occur that come from investing early. And just to give you an example, if you look and do a thought experiment, now this is a thought experiment. It's not saying that job training isn't important. But what it is saying is that if you were to invest the first dollar, the first euro, the first, the first uh, bolivar, whatever, into, the, into life cycle of life in schooling, prenatal programs in early year have the highest effect. Why? Because they create a skill base of health, motivation, abilities that then percolate through and that later education builds on. And it's this kind of dynamics of skill formation that is extremely important. It needs to be taken into account when we think about building projects. Uh, I don't know how much more time I have. If I have some more time? Yeah, okay, I'll t let me talk briefly uh, and give you some examples of this. I can talk at very gen draw pictures and so forth, but let me tell you about some projects where we actually have data. And the data not only will show you, and this is exactly the kind of data that can be collected. This was data collected by an experiment this is data that was collected uh, in the United States some 50, 60 years ago. And it wasn't just a cross section. It was data that was collected and is still being collected on people who were two or three years old in 1962 and who now are in their 50s and 60s and we can follow them into their adult life and into retirement even. So this program, Perry, was a very important project. It starts at age three. Very modest, two hours a day, two years. And I'll tell you something even more modest. But when we look at this and we follow these people and again get data that allow us to look at this randomized trial and these are giving children some stimulation, giving home visiting and so forth, what you find is tremendous uh, increase in, the, uh, uh, in terms of economic and social performance of the children in that experiment. So if you look at a dollar return just on earnings, what you can see is not only did they earn 10% rate of return, so 10% each year, very high rate of return on a passbook savings account. And what we also know is the, these so-called non-cognitive factors were greatly enhanced. In fact, one of the initial disappointments of the Perry program was it looked like IQ hadn't been changed that much. But what had happened was that children were very highly motivated. They were much less aggressive. They were much more likely to be, uh, to be uh, uh, academically oriented and so forth. Why? Because they were given stimulation and their parents were also visited. Similar effects from another program called ABC Darien. Again, more intensive, much more expensive, and these programs nonetheless have enormous effects. And what people sometimes forget is the role of these early education programs on things like health. So for example, if you look at blood pressure, you look at systolic pressure, 35 years, this is 35 years from the time they enroll in this program, these children are much healthier. You say, what's, what's, how is this? You're not teaching health. The program was not in any way no, motivated by having doctors and treat these children, no. What it was, and this is the way to think about how education and skills get produced, 
is the dynamic synergism. These children were highly motivated. They were educated so they could then read and understand what the health risks were. But they also were highly motivated in the sense that they, were, they learned self-control, they learned the ability to c control their lives. And this has tremendous impact. And so if you just look at the impact over the whole aspect of life cycle, you can see costly investment initially, but very high outcomes in terms of income, in terms of even the parents' income, uh, reduction in crime, and reduction in, uh, in, in improvement in health. So let me just conclude with a discussion of intergenerational impacts. Because we are educating children today, but those children will have children in the future. What do we know? What is the impact of these programs going forward? Well, fortunately, because we collected data longitudinally, we know not only what the original children did, which I just showed you, but we can follow their children. So these people now, remember their late 50s, early 60s, these people now themselves, their own children, if you look at the graphs, the children of the treatment group are much better. They're not suspended from school. They're much more likely to be employed. They're much more likely to be successful in many dimensions of life. And we could go through many other dimensions. I won't beat you to death with it. But there are other benefits as well. And this is another part of what we think about schooling. Frequently, we get so focused on the individual child. But we also need to think more broadly about the siblings and what the whole family structure is like. So for example, what we found among the Perry individuals was that even though the children themselves, uh, the siblings were not in school, they're, 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 one child was in school. And one other, the, the spillover to the other siblings was substantial. And uh, it led then, when you look at the total benefits of the individuals involved and the siblings, to tremendous increase. And to my mind, one of the most interesting findings from all of this work is the dependence on social mobility. I talked much earlier about this social mobility graph. Some people call it the Great Gatsby Curve. It's how, how important our early family, our family connections, early family lives, and the outcomes of the child's life. And here you can see two columns. The gray column here is the column that comes from the control group children. So it asks, how is their income, how is their education related to that of their parents' education? In most control situations, there's a very strong relationship between the parents' education and the child's education. But when these interventions are incurred, the relationship vanishes. You have much greater social mobility. Same thing is true about crime. If your parents are committed crime, you're much more likely to commit crime. But with intervention, reduce stronger effects there for males than females, but still strong effects. And so think about this whole process as a life cycle process. And I will give you one final version of this kind of analysis, a study that was done in Ireland not so long ago. And namely, looking at the effect of IQ. Many people talk about, well, you know, parents are smart, kids are smart, therefore we really can't do too much about that. Okay, well, if in this case here, if we look at the correlation, this is a home visiting program. And I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but the home visiting programs are very low intensity, much cheaper than these other programs. We're talking like an hour a week, programs that were successful in Jamaica, programs that I'm actually doing now in Gansu in China, now being replicated in places in Thailand and other countries, India. And what we see then is that if you look at the correlation of IQ between the mothers and the child, what you see is basically uh, uh, in the low treatment group, you get a very, very, in other words, a control group. What you get is basically a pretty high correlation, which is what's been found. But if you look at the group that actually gets treatment, the home visits, the home visits are an hour every two weeks, and they're essentially providing parents with information about how to raise children and how they might do things. So let me then just conclude with making a couple of other remarks. Namely, that I think cross-disciplinary cooperation is going to be essential, and I hope this happens. It's not just a matter of people who are trained specifically in an education school or a school of economics or in, in one line of thinking or another. 
If we synthesize psychology, sociology, education, statistics, AI, and neuroscience, we can create a much more dynamic version of learning and a, a society that actually is a learning society. And so I think what we've come to understand, and I know that you'll be talking about this in the next few days, is that in terms of even assessments, we can go way beyond standardized tests, games. All children are playing games. All of them are on social media. Those media can be used to essentially engage them, not just to give them lessons, but to assess them and to essentially learn a version of personalized education. So the social media provide an opportunity, I think, for allowing us to engage in a private, a personalized education. So let me just conclude by thanking you for your attention and by also uh, pointing my own enthusiasm for this opportunity that faces you. This is a very exciting challenge that you're doing. Unifying the systems of data, unifying even the systems of interpretation, and drawing on multiple fields and doing it in a way that's open-minded and creative. But to understand that education, learning is really what we're about. Not just education in a formal number of years of schooling, but literally learning, and learning takes place in families, firms, schools, and other institutions. And I think if we understand that, and we understand then that there are multiple sources of data that we can draw on. Administrative data, on achievement and behaviors, data from the social media that we actually get, literally children, there are a whole line of work done looking at measuring personality from social media, uh, surveys, media scraping. These are very challenging and very, op very great opportunities at the same time. And we can then develop an understanding of the interconnected, interrelated sources of learning. Schools and tests, yes, I'm not saying they should be abolished, not by any means. But I would just add to the mix the notion that families, firms, peers, and neighborhoods are very important. So I want to wish you good luck on the enterprise of these conference days and my best wishes, and I ask you to help, uh, let me help if I can. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Hickman. Um, we're just going to show a short film uh, while we rearrange the stage for two minutes, and then we'll resume with the high-level panel. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us while we rearrange. We'll um, start the high-level panel um, any minute now. Uh, I'd just like to thank again uh, Stefania Giannini, uh, Silvia Montoya, and Professor James Heckman for the, the opening of, of this conference. Um, we're going to hear from uh, eight, um, eight speakers now. We'll start with Her Excellency um, Ms. Figuera. Over to you. Thank you. Muy buenos días. Good morning. Good morning and thank you for the invitation. Now I'm happy to share with you our reflections on the role of data in education in particular in uh, uh, Colombia. My name is Aurora Vergara Figueroa. I'm the Minister of National Education for, in Colombia. And I'd just like to take a few minutes to give you a few considerations uh, along five key aspects. Uh, firstly, the importance of UNESCO in uh, producing information uh, about uh, education in Colombia and in the region. The uh, leadership of UNESCO in education has been vital for the changes we've seen in education in my country. And you can see this in the, uh, the strengths that we've gone through in our, our country in ensuring quality education, bolstering capacities in the regions, um, and more specifically, making sure that uh, uh, young people and children and adults uh, all around the world can uh, uh, can count on uh, uh, quality lifelong learning. And in particular, the work uh, undertaken by UIS uh, has uh, shone a strong light on the need to have monitoring mechanisms in place uh, for measuring uh, data, which are key for education. And and in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, we have uh, uh, the uh, UNESCO office and other institutions, and they've had a key role, such as, such as for example, the office in Santiago in Chile. Um, uh, they've play, played a strong leadership role in making sure that these uh, goals are being reached, and we're going to continue uh, boosting, uh, bolstering that leadership role going forward. In countries like uh, Colombia, uh, supporting uh, the, the finance required uh, is of key importance. We need uh, 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 not only financial but also human resources and infrastructure and uh, providing the data ensures that we can set realistic goals uh, so that we can work towards this quality goal and that is why we uh, have uh, seen quite a few goals uh, in this firstly uh, strengthening infrastructure in education make it, which uh, will uh, enable a thousand schools in rural uh, areas uh, which had uh, historically been Thank <laughs> Uh, affected by armed conflict uh, now to benefit from a uh, greater infrastructure. And uh, infrastructure needs to reflect the dignity of people. And that is why in this moment we have uh, submitted more than 400 uh, improvements in these uh, schools so that boys and girls uh, can have uh, better learning opportunities. So that's the first consideration I wanted to share with you. And that was the role of uh, UNESCO uh, in Colombia and in the region. A Second consideration concerns um, the importance for the sector of strengthening uh, uh, statistics uh, both nationally and also internationally. One basic premise that we've been working on in this conference is information systems and they should make sure that nobody is left behind. The question is, uh, is uh, how are we dovetailing these uh, information systems to ensure that we really can ensure comparability uh, internationally? Are we reaching these goals? Um, a couple of key aspects, uh, and here I'd like to um, uh, express uh, how satisfied we are with the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has been particularly connected and seen as a pillar in my country, at least, uh, as um, uh, when it comes to ensuring um, M&D for, uh, uh, for the initiatives undertaken. We have set national uh, targets, um, and the system has uh, enabled us to, in some ways, restore the dignity of people. In my country, we are facing 
having years and years of impact of uh, armed conflict uh, on the education system. So we need specific tailored measures so that we can um, we can heal the past uh, pain and wounds. And that is why the time that we are working towards these standardized uh, targets uh, are also enabling us to close some of these gaps. Um, oh, and so one of the questions that we need to ask is how can we guarantee that these systems do not actually exacerbate existing uh, inequalities? How can we guarantee that prejudices uh, do not get reproduced in the systems we create? Uh, and uh, um, because of this uh, impacts on uh, girls and women's participation in particular in uh, education. And, uh, and this is why I say we're restoring uh, human dignity. And how better to do it if not through education? A third consideration is uh, related to how to uh, in a com ensure comparative monitoring uh, of uh, the various different uh, indicators. How to in how can we make sure that each initiative is actually connected to achieving the targets and goals? And one of the ones that we have been working on in my country is to assess uh, how uh, youngsters in Colombia um, have been able to uh, get better results and in maths and science and in reading. The Dr. Heckman, I think, are um, Dr. Heckman's um, uh, insights, I think, are important when you take into those uh, in, in the two years prior to uh, to the edu education system. In other words, uh, the two years uh, uh, pre-primary education can actually um, make a huge difference. So we need to uh, create more opportunities for learning in those uh, crucial years, um, and uh, and by working with that uh, with our current cohort of students, we're hoping to see in the next few years that when they finally um, come up to the next uh, standardized test, they will actually uh, be able to deliver better results um, and display better learning outcomes. Um, and finally, by way of conclusion, um, how to make sure that uh, uh, we can re truly ensure comparability between statistics produced nationally and with other countries. And so what we wanted to, um, uh, to propose was that uh, we look at the national statistics challenges so that we can uh, attain that level of comparability comparability that is required for international comparison. One of the challenges that we are working on in my country is uh, uh, to ensure greater um, uh, greater enrollment rates uh, for youngsters uh, in um, my uh, country. Another comparability uh, issue, that, and we wanted to highlight, is that in part of the global uh, um, uh, data conference uh, that we are hosting in Colombia in uh, early 2024. We're hoping to come up with a roadmap that will enable us uh, to work uh, uh, towards ensuring um, a more comparable data for education. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Ms. Figuera, Minister of National Education, Colombia. We'll now hear from the Deputy Minister for Planning and Development, Ministry of Education, Saudi Arabia, His Excellency Abdul Ghani. In the name of God, most merciful, most compassionate, Your Excellencies, distinguished participants, firstly, on behalf of His Excellency, the Minister of Education in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, member of the SDG for Education High Level Steering Committee, I'm pleased to convey to you the best regards of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I also extend my thanks and gratitude to UNESCO for the kind invitation to attend this important conference, which focuses on improving the quality of educational data and statistics as a key pillar for monitoring SDG 4 by building optimal mechanisms according to a participatory framework, a framework that contributes to establishing priorities and support the progress in the Education 2030 Agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, since its creation, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has believed that ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities 
is a legitimate fundamental human right, a major driver for building and advancing human capabilities and a basis for providing young people with the necessary skills and values to confront the challenges of the 21st century, most importantly, the rapid acceleration that the world is experiencing in the fields of technology and digitalization and the related tremendous increase in the volume of data. In fact, this related tremendous increase in the volume of data is considered a main source of knowledge and a lifeline for scientific research. It's considered an enabler of the processes that allow the support and making of decision. Thus, it's important to create tools and techniques capable of dealing with new sources of big data. To ensure data governance and the use of the latest technologies to consolidate them, to make those data available and to protect them, the Kingdom has established agencies dedicated to data, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and digital government, in addition to developing the data sector by launching the National Strategy for Data and Artificial Intelligence and another strategy, which is the Open Data Strategy. The Ministry of Education also launched a data strategy and governance policy to ensure alignment with national and global standards and requirement in the field of data management around the world. Regarding the efforts deployed by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and regarding the efforts that countries must make in monitoring and measuring progress in achieving SDG 4 goals, allow me to share with you what the Kingdom had been working on. The Kingdom is working on building an adaptive data system capable of absorbing big data while achieving the strategic goals of education which includes indicators for SDG 4 and all the goals and targets that guarantee inclusive and equitable education, including indicators related to enrollment, qualifications and training of teachers, provision of basic services to schools, increasing literacy rates and others. Ladies and gentlemen, the statement of national commitment to transforming education in the kingdom declared during the Transforming Education Summit 2022 stipulated the need of taking procedures and policies to ensure a full recovery from COVID-19 pandemic, building a flexible and adaptive educational system in times of crisis, and ensuring sustainable government funding for education. In fact, the percentage of government expenditure on education from the GDP for 2022 amounted to more than 8% percent and in the year 2022 the kingdom achieved a percentage of more than 50% in the in the indicator related to one year of pre-primary education compared to 44.26% over the previous year on the other hand the kingdom seeks to build its human capabilities through the Human Capacity Development Program, one of the programs of the Kingdom's Vision 2030, which includes 89 or more than 89 national initiatives aimed at preparing globally competitive citizens by enhancing values and developing basic skills, developing future skills, and enhancing knowledge developments, which would make the citizens capable to keep abreast with the data revolution. Therefore, the Secondary Tracks Initiative has been launched. A specific educational track in secondary education has been allocated for computer science and engineering at the secondary level, which included the subject of artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. 
In addition to developing and including statistics in the business administration track and digital technology in the general educational track. This program also included an initiative for the digital single file for the student and a project to link this file with the Ministry of Health system to ensure a safe educational journey for children. In higher education, the percentage of enrollment in technical sciences, engineering and mathematics in 2023 reached more than 31 percent and more than 84 community colleges and humanities colleges were transformed into applied colleges that included computer science, cybersecurity, and the development of the required software. In the same context, the Kingdom established the National Center for e-learning to enhance e-educational and training for all through a package of programs and specialized courses in digitization and data science. At the same time, the Kingdom is keen to enhance effective statistical coordination with the UNESCO Institute for Statistics and all international organizations sharing the same vision to provide accurate data that reflect the Kingdom's progress on SDG 4 through the Kingdom's membership in the SDG 4 Education High-Level Steering Committee and its Technical Committee Sherpa as well as its membership in the UNESCO Technical Cooperation Group and other UNESCO regional centers and offices. In 2023, Riyadh hosted the fifth regional meeting, which issued the Arab region's 2024-2025 education roadmap to build the capabilities of and enable Arab countries to develop their national reports on SDG 4. I conclude my speech with the Kingdom's emphasis on the necessity of focusing on creating an effective partnership a partnership that enables states to develop their capabilities in the field of educational data and statistics through a comprehensive and sustainable approach that ensures optimal investment of their human and technical resources and improves the quality of their data to fulfill the goals and indicators of SDG 4 and the other SDGs. The Kingdom affirms that it will spare no effort to achieve fruitful cooperation with all actors and work with all international partners to advance development for the benefit of the humanity and the planet. Thank you. Thank you for your good attention. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. We'll now hear from the Deputy Director General of the Department of School Education and Literacy, the Minister, Ministry of Education in India, Mr. Hegde. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I congratulate UIS for attaining uh, or completing successful 25 years. I will wish uh, uh, UIS should grow much bigger and guide us, all of us. Uh, uh, this is my humble expectation. Uh, now, uh, I, uh, I am not making any presentation. I will uh, uh, experience, uh, share my experience uh, purely on data side. Uh, I am actually looking after the uh, education data in Government of India. Uh, we have 1.5 million schools, uh, 9.5 million teachers, and 250 to 260 million children. And we have to manage this. This is the, why I am telling is this will set the background. Now, we managed certain things to digital approach like uh, uh, online classes and uh, teacher trainings during uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, that has uh, taught us a very good lesson. Now, building upon that, uh, very recently uh, we shifted from the conventional approach of data collection to uh, digital based one. Uh, individual all. 250 million students, 9.5 million teachers have been allocated individual unique ID. Now, with this ID, uh, entire schooling should become ease and student first approach is the main objective of the government. How we will do it? For instance, in Indian scenario, if I tell, 
uh, on an average a student has to undergo an admission at least three times in their uh, say school cycle of 12 years like one to five then he will change a he or she will change a uh, school in the next uh, upper primary level etc now what happens is often uh, i hope it is the practice everywhere uh, especially in india uh, school wants a document from the parents and uh, proof of address and so all sort of things have been taken and this will become a cumbersome for the parents similarly when a student change, changes the classes document shifting from one school to the another one state to the another and it becomes a problem so to tackle this issue uh, with this unique id we have digitized everything uh, one time we will take a document then that unique id has been linked with the national id and it is stored in the id and as soon as the student moves from one school to the other one class to the other in the database they will only make a progression every year you no need to enter the details of the data once the student entered class one next year it is a progression if the student is dropped out we created a drop box then you trace that student and bring back to the mainstream and then uh, uh, for the teachers uh, the actual uh, deployment of the teacher also going through this uh, mo unique module and further this is one part the other part is uh, learning uh, details for instance a class one students applies for a olympiad or a sports uh, uh, achievements or any uh, essay competition that kind of things whatever small things at that level he or she achieves at class one pre-primary class two likewise that will be digitized and stored and it is available through the headmaster or the school head and the parents and over a period of 12 years these documents get accumulated in his or her account then based on this account a few uh, hours back uh, us experience was shared similarly now based on this after maybe after two years we can start thinking of a providing a equivalence for instance a student reaches a class 10 he fails in class 10 he could not complete it but he completed the class 10 classes so now based on all the his records anybody can make an assessment and also for suppose a person this is one case another case a student makes a progression progression from uh, school to colleges then he goes there he no need to provide anything any proof and his all only thing is he has to give a permission to the uh, institution where he is he or she is entering then all documents are or his uh, uh, academic achievements can be visible and based on that his admission can be done so ultimately our goal of making a student first and the ease of schooling has started in india uh, only request is uh, the uh, from the uis side i have one more small request uh, uis has done a wonderful job by designing a unified data entry format that's a very good one that uh, gives you a very clear idea when you make an entry in the data where exactly we are going wrong or what was the kind of error and how its linkage has been done but only thing is you you take a lot of data from the countries especially we at least we are feeling i know that but many of the data is not visible back to us for other remaining countries so for instance if nationally i want to make a certain policy decision based on uh, say what kind of size of a school is an ideal school for a country? Maybe students with 500, uh, or school with 500 students, schools with 300 students, uh, what kind of teacher deployment? I wanted to study that for the remaining country so that I can learn a lesson. So for that purpose, present system, I am not getting back how many different level or type of schools are there in different countries. So that is not visible to us. So only my request is, uh, you since you are taking already data, you took a lot of pain to build the database. Now let this be available to all the partner countries so that we can also access the data and we can use it for our own betterment purpose. So that is one part. Similarly, teachers, uh, level-wise, gender-wise, teachers also that is a very important uh, aspect. A SDG goal says it's a gender neutral. So to achieve that, uh, uh, different countries are adopting their own methodologies to fulfill that gap. 
India has, uh, especially in female teacher recruitment now, we, we are uh, more female teachers than male teachers. They are exceeding almost maybe two, three percentage times, but whereas if you count the number, it may be 100,000 uh, uh, is excess. So therefore, what I'm telling, uh, uh, pressing is, if you give back that data or give the access to that data, that will be very useful for the countries who can learn from the one who is doing a better job. That is uh, one aspect. Other is, uh, like uh, somebody was mentioning uh, in the beginning, uh, digital uh, availability of the facilities in the schools and uh, colleges. So there also, we are giving a lot of data uh, in the UIS format, like schools with internet facilities, schools with uh, uh, computers, schools with various facilities. This data also, UIS uh, definitely displays this data in the various different websites, like in the SDG portal side it is available. But uh, the uh, problem what we are facing, especially in India, is uh, like in your main website, it is not displayed. So that uh, global agencies who are drawing data from your website, they miss out. They say uh, India has not provided the data, so they will not assign you a value. So their only request is, UIS has done a fantastic job, but uh, to build upon that, you have to have one common thing to the outside users. For instance, uh, somebody, some organization, World Economic Forum, who wanted to draw data from US, let them be guided to the proper web portal, because data is already available. Only thing is, it is just a streamlining kind of thing. If it can be done, then it will be of great use to a country like us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hegde. We'll now hear from the Director of Research, Monitoring and Evaluation for the Ministry of Education in South Africa, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Distinguished uh, fellow panelists, um, conference delegates, uh, representatives of UNESCO, uh, it's a privilege to bring greetings from South Africa, uh, and in particular from uh, the Ministers of Basic Education, Higher Education and Training, and also the Head of Statistics South Africa. Uh, it is also a privilege for me to be able to participate here and, and to do so after uh, the opening address by Professor James Heckman. Uh, I'm an economist, so I'm well aware of just how well he exemplifies somebody who uh, both sees the big picture and is able to communicate the big picture about things like why education is so important, but also is at the cutting edge of the technical details of measurement and statistics. So uh, I hope that in some ways that measures the combination that we're going to receive here over the next three days. Uh, because I think we're going to get into a lot of the, the details. Um, his work, especially on, on the value of early education, uh, has been massively influential all around the world, uh, and it has so in South Africa too. I think in the last few years we've seen an increased focus on early childhood education. I know at an institutional level uh, we have had a shift of responsibilities for early childhood development from the Department of Social Development to the Department of Basic Education. And I think that rep represents institutionally a recognition of the value and importance of early learning as well. Um, and so if, if Professor Heckman's uh, address is anything to go by, I think we're in for a really exciting next few days. Um, and I think this, the first UAS conference on education, data, and statistics really comes at a significant moment globally. Um, we have new technologies and a more inclusive set of values in education, uh, meaning that there are new areas that require attention. Uh, yet at the same time, we have a long way to go in the core business of, of education, things like participation in schooling and the quality of learning. Um, at the same time, many countries are still working to recover from the uh, disruptive effects of the pandemic, and other countries are experiencing uh, conflicts. Um, so we have many pressing needs, many different educational values that all require attention, and so what we measure and how we measure it really matters. And I think the program for the next three days uh, does promise to, to really get practical in these measurement questions. Um, it looks like it's going to be addressing many of the issues that affect people like me, and I'm sure many of, of the delegates, many of you here today, uh, people who work with data collection systems, data management systems, and the reporting side of it. And so, so for me, um, I'm aware that many of these issues require uh, 
careful, detailed attention, and, and therefore I'm hopeful, looking at the program, that this conference is going to help us all collaborate a lot better on these important issues. And I've, I've, I've made a list of five things that I really hope uh, this conference helps us all with. Um, firstly, I hope that it helps us improve uh, the comparability of data across countries, but also over time. Um, but at the same time, is still affording compatibility uh, for local needs and local data systems. I think some of the other speakers have already alluded to that tension. Um, a second hope is that I, I hope it helps us uh, to measure and hold accountable ourselves for the most core elements of education, um, things like learning outcomes. Uh, but at the same time as we do this, we're going to need to treat statistics with, with a lot of wisdom and caution. I think the introduction of SDG 4.1.1 around access to quality learning was a very bold shift in the global agenda for education towards not just measuring the amount of education and access to it, but also the quality of learning in our schools. Uh, but I think along with that bold new shift has, has come a whole new set of technical issues around how we measure that, how we have comparable statistics. And so I hope we, we continue um, to do that hard work because it is such an important um, issue. Thirdly, um, I hope that this conference helps us to keep focused on what is core to education and on those aspects that take a really long time to accomplish, things like participation and learning but also at the same time helps us expand focus to either previously neglected areas or, or new areas, um, such as issues of inclusivity, education for sustainable development, how we use new technologies, and, and the list will go on. Fourthly, I hope that it helps us to make data widely accessible and to do things like use unique identifiers to combine data sources, but at the same time helps us to do that while building data security protocols to protect confidential information. Um, that is another tricky tension. I think Prof Heckman's address spoke about um, the, the important links across the life cycle of learning, um, showing how important it is to link uh, early learning data sets with the same people or the same children later on in their educational pathways, but also the links across domains like health and social well-being and learning. So in, in many ways that has practical implications for how we integrate our data systems, but it also presents challenges for how we do that in a secure way. And fifthly, I hope that uh, this conference helps us to explore opportunities for collecting new data, uh, doing exciting new data visualization things, but at the same time, not to the neglect of the reliability of our underlying data generating and data collection systems. Um, because I do think sometimes there's a trade-off between the kind of amount of data that we collect and making sure that, that the core data sets, that, or the core data we collect is, is still reliable. As I conclude then, I think it's also worth noting that there are, there are going to be uh, constraints to the way that data and evidence can influence policy. For those of us in that in nexus between policy and evidence, we, we're constantly wrestling with that. Obviously, there are constraints, things like financial constraints. Um, but I think one thing we can do uh, that is ambi an unambiguously a good thing would be that if we, if we do improve the quality of our data, the accessibility of our data, and the reputation of our statistics, um, then that can only improve the chances that data and evidence will in fact lead to better policy making and programming. And so, uh, as, as I conclude then on behalf of South Africa and the South African delegation with, with me here today, um, let me first congratulate the UAS for this really important conference um, and then also wish everyone here a productive and enjoyable next three days. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. We'll now hear from the Director of Strategy, Statistics and Planning and National Coordinator for SDO4 from the Ministry, Minister of Education and Sports of Morocco, Mr. Bacher. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I am delighted to participate uh, in this uh, uh, UNESCO conference on statistics and also to uh, be uh, on this panel on behalf of uh, uh, the minister who uh, apologizes to uh, 
uh, Ms. Giannini. Uh, he was uh, very much determined to be with you this morning, uh, but was uh, unable to attend, and he did ask me to represent him here. Let me first thank uh, UNESCO and Ms. Stefania Giannini and uh, the UIS, uh, Ms. Montoya, for uh, inviting uh, Morocco to this conference on uh, education data and statistics. I uh, do hope that this conference is the first of many and that uh, we will uh, continue these conferences uh, open to all those parties that are concerned by this issue and that can uh, help in uh, improving the availability, quality and relevance of education data. From our own point of view, let me just recall that the uh, production of uh, education data and statistics um, by our country's uh, response to two uh, major concerns. And the first is a national concern. We uh, need these uh, indicators uh, and data to plan uh, our action in uh, education, uh, to justify annual budgets, to um, find uh, agreements uh, within government, especially with Ministry of Finance, and to report on progress made in the implementation of our strate uh, strategic objectives and uh, global globally agreed aims. You know that education is a national priority for many countries. And uh, it uh, is uh, monitored by the highest authorities as well as by our parliaments. And we do need to uh, report on our progress, and this is what data helps us to do. There is also a, um, a requirement internationally. We need to report to the international community, thanks to uh, education data, as to the uh, implementation of SDGs, and in particular SDG 4. And this is highly important, as the countries have just renewed at the uh, 2022 New York uh, Summit on Transforming Education uh, their international commitments. And we do need the data to be able to um, report on our uh, commitments. So whether this is for domestic or global reasons, the availability of statistics, their relevance, their quality, are all fundamental, and they are also fundamental for decision-making. You cannot conceive of a strategy today that is not evidence-based. And this is uh, what the uh, High-Level Steering Committee is working on. It is a specific uh, request on their agenda. We will also need to agree as to the type of statistics and the minimum indicators required, the granularity required, and to make sure that we agree on concepts and definitions, and to um, uh, limit uh, estimates or uh, declarative data or those uh, that call upon uh, players outside the educational system, as it is always very complicated to uh, uh, receive this data. So. The data systems that we do uh, wish for is a costly investment, and we need an annual budget to keep them up and running. If countries decide uh, to make these investments, they must uh, optimize them and build them progressively. Uh, these systems must also be used in full. We must make the best of them. So. In order not to uh, take up too much of your time, let me perhaps just highlight three challenges that we believe uh, are important for this conference. The first has to do with monitoring indicators uh, uh, for the implementation of the 43 targets of uh, SDG 4 
uh, and there is some uh, complexity in terms of uh, annual data because they are based on household surveys or they need to clarify the uh, calculation methods at national level or simply because there is no national system uh, for these measurements. And let me simply uh, state, uh, for instance, uh, in uh, uh, the results of uh, learning, we only have PISA results in Morocco. And this is not sufficient to give a complete overview of uh, learning outcomes in Morocco. And it is the same for out-of-school children. Uh, we have uh, dropout rates. Uh, that is uh, only per age group and not for the whole population. So we need to improve on that. Uh, achievement rates, again, uh, needs to uh, be done for the uh, full population. We do not do this annually. Uh, we do it per age group, and it's uh, an approximation. So we need to clarify this matter. Also, the proportion of teachers with minim minimum qualifications. Uh, we always have 100% as a figure, but we need to agree as to what are these minimum qualifications so that we can truly report on uh, the progress in each country. A second challenge has to do with finding a broad consensus on the definition of those indicators that will be used in uh, improving reporting on progress on the new areas uh, uh, monitored by the uh, high-level steering committee, such as greening education, digital learning and youth participation. And I know that there is a lot of work done today to move forward on uh, common definitions, but we will really need to um, work on this to um, improve our benchmarks and to move from 7 to 10. The third challenge is to find the best approach to make use of new technologies and artificial intelligence and big data in order to uh, facilitate uh, the collection of data and the management of data and indicators in the field of education, and especially to make use of them in defining reforms, policy reforms uh, that are evidence-based, based on countries' priorities, and uh, also uh, for funding reasons. Without uh, evidence, you cannot convince your donors. Uh, I coordinate uh, donors for education at national level in Morocco, and I can, ensure, I can assure you that even if we can convince our, our donors, all funding is conditioned by achieving indicators, and indicators are verified annually, internally, by uh, general inspections uh, of the finance ministry and by audits of our donors. So we need to work on indicators, we need to work on reliability and uh, whether they truly reflect the progress made uh, by our countries. So Morocco is highly uh, concerned by all of these subjects that are on the agenda of our uh, conference, and Ms. Giannini knows this. We uh, launched a very ambitious uh, reform a couple of years ago uh, to update our information and statistics uh, system uh, in order to ensure the monitoring of these indicators. Uh, and we will be working very actively in our delegation over the next three days for the success of this event. We count on the support uh, of uh, UIS to uh, improve our system further. Uh, we have many systems. Uh, we have a system for uh, children, uh, for uh, teaching, for schools. We need integration and coordination, and we need to move from an information system to statistical information that uh, is uh, um, rich, complex, and that enables us to report on our progress. So again, thank you very much for this invitation and full success to this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bader. We'll now hear from the Deputy Director of the Ministry of Education in Malawi, Ms. Moale. Good morning. On behalf of the Minister of Education from Malawi, Honorable Madaritsukambawa Wilima, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for having Malawi uh, as one of the delegates for the conference, but also having us in this high-level panel discussion. First of all, I would like to highlight some statistics for Malawi so that the delegates can appreciate 
that there are different uh, perspectives and the different statistics from different countries. In Malawi, the formal age for starting formal schooling is six years old for primary school. And at the moment, the uh, net intake for six year olds is at 79%. That doesn't mean that the remaining 21% doesn't come to school, but they come at different ages. So you find some starting school at seven years, some at eight, even nine-year-olds will be found in a standard one or grade one class. We don't uh, send them back, we still allow them because that's their opportunity to come to school. That brings some problems because you have children of different ages starting school at the same time. And that also increases the numbers of children in a classroom. We have large classes, some going as large as 150 or more learners in one class with one teacher. I would also like to share with you uh, some rates, like survival rate is at 39% for primary school. That's a standard one to eight. The transition rate from primary to secondary school is currently at 47%, and the completion rate for secondary school is at 22.3%. You can see that those are that is disturbing data which Malawi as a country and the Minister of Education is trying as much as possible to ensure that more learners are coming to school but also completing both primary and secondary schools. For most countries, it's COVID-19 that brought a lot of disruption to teaching and learning. But for Malawi and other countries in the southern African part. We have had pandemics in the past uh, five years or so. We have had cyclones like Cyclone Freddy, Cyclone Anna, and so on that made children not to come to school for weeks and months. And some did not return when schools opened. Last year, we had a cholera outbreak. For several weeks, schools were closed, and some children did not return to school. Zambia, for instance, has the same problem currently, and the schools that were supposed to open in January are still closed. They will open later this month. I'm highlighting this to bring to your attention that when we talk about education, data and the statistics, we must also think about problematic areas, areas that are faced with challenges that keep children out of school and that the data doesn't look very good because children are staying out of school longer than required. There are also successes that we've registered as a country apart from having these challenges. And one of them is that girls' enrollment has increased over the years. The gender parity index is at 1.03. And you'll find that more girls are coming to school than boys currently. And this is one of example of how data has helped us to come up with interventions to address gender equality in education. There are many interventions that a country has that has helped to put more girls in school. And that shows the importance of discussing issues of education data and statistics. But also as a country, we celebrate the fact that although we have problems and the fact that we are still using paper and pencil to collect data, we produce and publish education statistics bulletin on a yearly basis. So we have a base to show 
uh, the world that this is how our data is looking like. On a yearly basis, a bulletin is published to show how we are doing in different aspects in terms of data. With these challenges and the, the few successes that we have, I have highlighted, I would like to uh, emphasize that this conference is important for us because we would like to learn and share with the international community on how best we can ensure that we uh, education data in education is helping us to come up with interventions and other solutions that we need in our education system. As a country, we would like to move towards the use of technology and digitalization to enable us to collect high-frequency data. As I said, that we still have uh, cases of dropout and absenteeism. This needs us to collect high-frequency data because this happens on a daily basis. So as a country, we would like to move uh, towards the use of technology in, when collecting education data. But also would like as a country to build capacity of all stakeholders that are involved in collecting and processing education data. The use of uh, paper and pencil way of collecting data proves to be time consuming and it requires a lot of people to be involved. But if we move into the use of technology, we'll be able to collect more data within a short period of time and to process the data as quickly as we can. But also we need to move into using the right tools in our collecting of the data. So in this conference, as a country, we would like to learn more on how best we can use the best tools in order to collect data that is authentic, to collect data as quickly as we can and to have it processed and use the same to come up with interventions and solutions to the challenges that we have in our education system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gnoli. We'll now hear from the Senior Director of Programs for Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, Mr. Adiena. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, really wonderful opportunity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Your Excellencies, esteemed delegates, and um, all protocols observed, I'd like to start uh, by thanking the UNESCO Institute for statistics uh, for this invitation, uh, in particular to such a beautiful city, Paris, is a dream destination for any conference goer, I would say. And, and so really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here uh, to speak at this uh, inaugural conference on data and statistics. And huge congratulations for bringing together such a global audience uh, to discuss this really important topic. Um, I hope you are all awake. The lighting here is perfect for the people sitting on the stage, but I highly suspect, especially for those who are jet lagged behind there, uh, it's quite conducive um, for a quick nap. Uh, but um, as you've had, we've had really wonderful, uh, you know, conversations and uh, really amazing interventions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor um, Heckman, for that really beautiful presentation. I've learned a lot from you. Uh, and I hope to pick some of it, uh, you know, for, for some of our audiences. At the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, our vision really is a world where data and technology are driving sustainable and equitable development. We work currently with over 700 organizations uh, drawn from the private sector, multilateral agencies, um, you know, uh, private sector, big and small companies, uh, national NGOs, international NGOs, anybody who's really interested in how data can be harnessed for sustainable development data. Uh, with all these diverse backgrounds and perspectives, really we all believe that data and technology can be key instruments for social good. And that's what we collaborate about. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as I said here, I must admit that I'm a product of an education system. I come from Kenya, uh, for your information, and I'm glad the Kenyan delegation uh, is represented here. I come from a, a system that paid attention when I was going to school. Uh, literally, everybody paid attention, I would say that. You know, uh, my dear parents, uh, the teachers, the administration, uh, and going beyond that, you know, grandparents, uh, uncles, uh, the community, the neighbors, uh, you could not uh, go on to do any mischief uh, without anybody educating you. And that education, of course, uh, took different forms, including uh, dragging you by the ear to take you to your parents uh, to report you. Um, that has changed a lot. And, and so the question is, how is the education system really changing and adapting to this uh, changed environment. Um, and we all came from these education systems and we've seen these changes. And therefore, over the next couple of days, my challenge to you is, you know, think about people. Uh, think about those we left behind. Think about our children um, and generations that are going to come because uh, when we discuss data, we must look at data and the representation of people in data. So it's not just about data and statistics. Behind those figures and numbers are lives and livelihoods. And that's the most important thing. Um, and so we must go back to empowering educators all around us in a holistic manner. And data is a powerful catalyst uh, for this. Uh, and I'm glad uh, Professor Huckman actually alluded to this. Um, you know, you took a bit of uh, wording from my speech here, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and since learning never stops, uh, uh, you know, I'm also still learning as an individual uh, from a very special person in this very room, my wife, who's uh, a very special person, our assistant, seated right there. She was behind me. Thanks for joining me. So learning never stops, even in marriages and relationships. So we continue to learn. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, shifting to a more important uh, issue, uh, we find ourselves at a pivotal uh, moment in our journey towards achieving SDG 4. With the 2030 deadline looming even closer, I would say it is imperative that we take stock of our progress and chart a course forward that is guided by data informed by innovation and driven by a collective commitment from all of us to leave no one behind. Um, together with the World Bank, we commissioned an analysis by Dalberg on past investments that showed that an average return, it showed that an average return, and this was mentioned earlier by Assistant uh, um, uh, General, um, of $32. For every dollar you invest in a data system, you get a return of $32. What this means is that if you invest $1 in a particular education system in a country, you're likely to yield $32 in quantifiable returns in the form of different uh, outcomes. And therefore, we must think about more resources, both financial and technical, going into the education systems uh, across, uh, across the world. Through the Power of Data Initiative, we are working with countries to unlock the data dividend in order to harness economic, social, and political opportunities. We are doing this through strong national data partnerships, bringing together existing plans, initiatives, and public and private, uh, and private stakeholders. Um, and I'm glad that Judith is here from FCDO since they've been a strong funding partner for this particular initiative across the world. So it's great connecting with you. Now, we need ministries of education and other stakeholders in the sector to actively participate in these partnerships because these are strategic collaborations that are driving timely, ethical, and efficient data use and strengthening statistical systems, including those powering quality and inclusive education for all. I think we've heard about structural issues, uh, and these are challenges we don't necessarily need to overemphasize. Access to technology, and even once you access the technology, does the infrastructure have the capability to support uh, you know, that, that technology? Now, once you have the infrastructure, do the individuals powering those systems actually have the capacity uh, to work on the data? Uh, do you have the infrastructure to support data sharing and simplification and even communicating the data? Because it has to go beyond the numbers, uh, as they say. But we know that education is not merely a fundamental human right. It's a powerful catalyst 
for social progress, economic prosperity, and sustainable development. Uh, but we know, and it's been mentioned here, uh, education goes beyond academic systems. Uh, with remarkable innovations and emerging technologies, including AI, we must strengthen capacity, prioritize and invest significant financial and technical resources in order to accelerate the promise of transforming how we collect, analyze, and report and report on education data. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not talking enough about AI, and I hope that over the next three days, artificial intelligence is going to be one of the major uh, discussions. If that does not happen, then we miss an opportunity um, that this potentially disruptive technology, but very progressive technology, uh, can actually um, uh, apply. So beyond technical expertise and financial resources, we desperately need political leadership. And I'm going to repeat, we need political leadership uh, because in the absence of that, you can talk data statistics, but if the political class do not really get it or understand, then it becomes really difficult to invest more uh, in what we are talking about here. Uh, we also need effective multilateral and multisectoral governance and coordinating mechanisms and a shared commitment uh, towards collaboration and cooperation beyond our respective borders. And I believe there are many examples of collaboration that we are going to learn from here. So in conclusion, I'm excited by the potential of uh, all of us uh, collaborating in data for education in order to tackle the challenges that lie ahead, setting a progressive future agenda for education statistics through new partnerships that will propel us towards our shared goal of ensuring quality education for all. Uh, and let's just remember that the power of data yesterday, today, and tomorrow will continue to shape and transform future generations. It is therefore our responsibility as stewards of data to ensure that it is accurate, inclusive, comprehensive, actionable, and more importantly, is guided by data values. Together, we must rise to this challenge before us and seize this really historic opportunity to offer progressive ideas that will make quality education a reality for all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Adieno. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Ms. Herbertson, Head of Girls Education Department, FCDO. Thank you, and good morning. I'm delighted to be here, and a big thank you and congratulations to UNESCO and UIS. There are those whose eyes glaze over at the two words data and statistics, assuming they will be inaccurate, manipulated, possibly boring even, and AI should, but may not help us over the coming years. I am no statistician, don't be too shocked, but I know that robust data underpin the story that we need to inform political, financial, and pedagogical decisions, to advocate globally and nationally for more and better investments in education, to better target our support to where children are and what they need, and to track progress, measure impact, and hold ourselves to account. The current data, where they exist, are clear. Many education systems are under profound stress. Back in 2021, when the UK held the G7 presidency, we agreed two global objectives for girls' education, envisaged as stepping stones towards 2030 and the measurement of SDG4. Firstly, 40 million more girls in school, and secondly, 20 million more girls able to read by the age of 10 or the end of their primary education, both in low or lower middle income countries by 2026. Now the first annual report on progress is ready and the news is not good. Firstly, there are now over 2 million more girls out of school than in 2021. COVID, conflict, climate change, population growth, the ban on girls in education in Afghanistan have all reversed progress. And secondly, there are insufficient nationally reported data to measure progress on learning. Now we know what we measure matters. We need to know what children are doing from early on in life, all children, not just literacy and numeracy, but also the socio-emotional skills that we heard so powerfully about in the earlier lecture. 
We work with very big numbers and we can lose sight of the children behind those numbers. But all children means all individual children, wherever they are, including the girl living in poverty, in an urban slum or a remote rural area, a refugee with a disability, in child labor, the victim of violence, in child marriage, pregnant, all or any of those. And it is for that girl that we need the data. And then for all the other girls and boys like that girl, as well as those that are more fortunate. And our governments need to understand and act upon reliable, timely and comparable data, notwithstanding sometimes difficult political settings. And the data on access to education, dropout rates and completion levels are improving. That's the good news. But we don't yet have consistent and comparable measures for foundational skills, the building blocks for children's later learning. And with seven out of 10 children in low and lower middle income countries leaving primary school unable to read, we are at a crisis point. And there is a real risk that SDG 4.1.1a, the critical indicator of children's early grade learning outcomes, is being dropped from the SDG framework. And that's not going to improve the situation. As a founding member of the Global Coalition for Foundational Learning, the UK is very concerned. We have, however, and it's a great privilege, just taken up the donor seat on the SDG 4 High Level Steering Committee and we will be working with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as the focal Sherpa on data and monitoring. And we're very much looking forward to this role and to championing data for education. But there is much more we need to do. We need to increase the amount and quality of data in emergency and protracted crisis settings. There is currently no central repository of data for those children. We need to understand how climate change is affecting education systems and changing lives. We need to step up our commitment to children with disabilities. All data should be disaggregated to show disability status, targeting support and eliminating the stigma. And we need better metrics to understand and address the levels of violence that children are experiencing in sanction through corporal punishment and around school, particularly for girls, particularly for children with disabilities. No child can learn when really scared and not feeling safe. Now that girl to whom I referred earlier is often invisible in the data that we have. And only when we have good timely data about whether she is in school and learning, can we help to understand how we can fulfill her potential and hopes for her life. And on that rests the future prosperity, peace and sustainability for us all. So we have a long journey ahead, but I'm very encouraged by what I'm already hearing today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Herbertson, and, and thank you to all of the speakers today. Um, I'm, I'm from the world of data, but not the world of education data and statistics. It's been a real privilege and honor to, to have a glimpse into the things that matter to you and, and that will improve lives. The, the things that I've learned from all the speeches so far are that early education and, and its lifetime benefits for children and the adults they become and their families and communities is so important. And we've heard AI mentioned a few times. We're obsessed with AI at The Economist. Every part of the world is going to be using it to improve things, to gain efficiencies, to save time so you can concentrate on the things that really matter. Um, the words that I, I really enjoyed hearing several times were cooperation and collaboration and, and learning from other countries while still being aware, that, <clears throat> aware of the challenges that some countries face with data collection. And finally, um, planning and investment. I, I think improving the quality of data means improving the quality of children's lives all around the world. And this conference is, is going to be very important in achieving that. Thanks to everyone. Uh, we'll resume in here in uh, 10 short minutes. Thank you.